And good morning. The Lord bless you, as uh, Kathy has played. The Lord, uh, he is my joy and my crown, and I trust that that would be true for you as well. Those of you here this morning that braved the elements, those of you that are watching on, uh, on the internet, we're grateful again that we can gather and be the church of Jesus Christ. So, it is a touchless service. Again, uh, I found a Bible that had a bulletin in it this morning from February the 2nd, 2020. I said, boy, that's ancient history. My, oh my. But uh, what it does do, without necessarily a bulletin, we are thinking about going with MailChimp and sending out newsletters via email, and we'll also have some printed copies for those. So we're just exploring what that looks like, uh, so that especially as we move into the Thanksgiving and the Christmas season, we can get information out to you in a timely fashion. So, but for the rest, as you see, uh, this is same old, same old, right? Touchless service. So that's where we're at. Anyone else feel like Halloween is unnecessary this year? I've been wearing a mask and eating candy for seven months. I don't think I need a day dedicated to it anymore. I'm just going, yeah, that's a good line. And because of that, I just wanted to make sure that people knew we're not having a trunk and treat event this uh, coming Saturday. Normally we've had one, but uh, again, with CDC guidelines and all of that, we're saying we're not going to do that this year. So uh, you can stay home and turn off all your lights. Okay, don't. <laughs> Uh, let's see, Women's Bible Study, we're not meeting this coming Tuesday. We've got some folks that are in quarantine, and with some of our chronologically gifted folks, uh, we're just saying that's not going to be. So they've made that call. Uh, no story this coming Tuesday. Uh, Tuesday night, though, we still have, uh, if you're interested at all, talk to Sue, and uh, we're going to explore the mom-to-mom -mom ministry. And so if you have any questions, talk to her right after the service. Wednesday is still youth group, so uh, you'll notice the time change, 6.30 to 7.30 for junior high, and senior high then starts at 8 o'clock. Staying on that Wednesday night theme, I'd like to know some parents that uh, are bringing their child at least to a junior high, if you're interested at all in doing a Bible study with me, we'll be socially distanced and we'll see, but I just need to know, do I have to have three sheets or 20 sheets? So if you're interested today, uh, no, maybe I should do a you know, raise your hand and then I can count like a tele-evangelist. Uh, I won't do that. All right. If you're interested, uh, let me know, please, so I can make some preps for that. So this, I want to start this coming Wednesday, have something at least for parents. So as you come, Kathy and I want to say thank you uh, from feeding us to uh, blessing us with an email or a text. It was a joy and a delight. And uh, if there was such a thing as Congregation Appreciation Month, or Sunday, Kathy and I would do that and say thank you so much for being a blessing as we journey together. We truly feel like you're our family, and that's a joy to us. So thanks for that as well. Uh, as we think, because of COVID, uh, it's pretty hard to get 400 people in here for Thanksgiving meal. And so the consistory has asked uh, whether or not there would be interested folks uh, to come alongside Linda and if we would do a curbside Thanksgiving service. And so we're trying to figure out how people would register and how many meals and that sort of a thing. But if you're interested in either donating food or money, or if you could help the night before to uh, prep the food, and, uh, or be here the night of that Wednesday the 18th, and we'll just let people be in their cars and we'll somehow usher them through and serve them that way. So if you're interested at all, either uh, call Amber at the church, better yet, give Linda a shout. So... We'll see if it goes, right? We don't want to shut down all ministry, but uh, we'll see if we can be a blessing to God's people. Next week, if you can, uh, bring in your boxes or your donations for the Operation Christmas Child. There are still boxes out there if you forgot to do that, and uh, you can just bring them in. Talk to Kathy if you have any more questions on that. And hopefully, starting next week, Sunday, if you're at all interested in uh, our new members class, just exploring the church, again, you can come to class and not if you just want to find out information, what does it mean to be a Christian? What does it mean to be part of the Reformed Church? What does it mean to be part of the church in the world? Uh, that's the stuff we'll talk about. And so text me or email me if you would, and that would be a joy. I'm going to give you an extra hour. Isn't it great to have that authority? No. So don't forget to do that this coming Saturday, and uh, we'll see you Sunday bright and cheery. Don't misuse that hour if you can. All right. Uh, Let's see. We're going to read together. 
God's people. Blessed are you, O God, creator of all that is. Blessed are you, O God, who made us in your image. Blessed are you, O God, who are with us right here and now. Blessed are you, O God, and we open our hearts in praise to you. Thanks be to God for his presence here. Oh, that's a little tough on the eyes, but let's see. Can we pray? I'll have the team come on up while we're doing that. So, team, come on up. Let's pray. From the time you fashioned the heavens and the earth from a formless void, O God, your creative energy has done marvelous works all around us. May your creative spirit be at work in our hearts and minds today as we worship you and always as we strive to live in obedience to your will. Amen and amen. Thanks be to the Lord. Grace and peace to us from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Through the working of the Holy Spirit, thanks be to Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen and amen. So, let's uh, stand together. If you're comfortable, you can sing. If you've got a mask, you can sing. Otherwise, let the people around you bless you. Let's sing together.
seated. Though the wrong seems off so strong, we seem to be living in some of those times right now, and it's our joy and our privilege to be able to come and to spend time praying to our Father, being anxious for nothing but giving those things over to Him. He has not abdicated. He is still on the throne. His story is still being unfolded, and it will all be to his honor and glory. So again, if you're a guest with us and uh, you have any questions about Jesus Christ, it would be our joy and privilege to uh, share and or to listen to your questions, but perhaps to answer those. So email or call us. Um, the Burns is uh, still are not together. So Bernetta is in Sioux Falls. They're at Luther Manor. And Harvey is still at uh, Well Cove, used to be Hilda's place there in Lenox. And uh, between having some challenges with his phone and or uh, his wife being gone, and now you can't even sit on the front porch to go and visit, I'm thinking that uh, it would be really helpful if you as a congregation do what you do so well. I know that you've done it in the past, but let's kind of inundate him with a card this week if you can. And uh, if you need his telephone number or cell phone number, uh, just call us and we can get that to you or use the mobile app. There's a good plug for that, right? The Breeze Church mobile app. So let's see if we can cheer him up this week. That'd be a good thing. Continue to pray for Donna and for uh, testing results and this new medication that's there. Uh, had a conversation with uh, Darlene yesterday on the East Coast over Boston uh, Hospital has released George. So he's home. He's going to be there for a few weeks before he'll start his chemotherapy treatments. So just alerting you to that as well as giving thanks to God for continued health. Um, the mother, Joyce, is uh, in rehab and they're working on pain management as well as physical therapy. So thank you, God, for that. Luetta is home as well, so she has both a landline as well as a cell phone. You can call her on that. But uh, she had a daughter from Minneapolis with her last week. I think the daughter from Atlanta is coming this week and uh, staying alongside of her. So she hopes she had a doctor's appointment canceled, and uh, the cast hopefully will come off tomorrow, and they'll either give her a new one that will be shorter and or a splint. And so she's happy for that. So that's it there. Uh, let's see, the praise team, we've got a few folks um, that uh, were unable to get here because of snow and shoveling snow or driving distance and that kind of a thing. We've got other folks in our congregation that are uh, quarantining either safety-wise and or because somebody's tested positive in their family, in the church at least. And so, uh, yeah, it's slipping in here, there, and everywhere. Thanks for being careful. We try to do everything we can. And uh, just to let you know, if ever... It becomes more, and we need to uh, call something. We will let you know through, again, email, text, and or putting things on both Facebook and others. So, whew. and schools, country, the upcoming elections. What are we, not even uh, 10, 9 days away? And so there's much that we need to pray into our... our so, with that, focus in on the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit who helps us to pray, the Holy Spirit who brings comfort and guidance, the Holy Spirit who helps turn our attention to Jesus Christ so that we look constantly to Him. Are you ready to engage in the privilege of prayer? Let's do that together, shall we? Lord, the strains of music are still lingering in our, in our minds this is our Father's world. It's yours, God, and you've privileged us 
by creating us. You've privileged us by giving us a mandate to uh, reflect your glory. You've privileged us to recognize who it is that you are. You've led us, again, through the wonderful working of the Holy Spirit, recognize our need for a Savior, and you provided. God, you so loved the world that even though while we were still sinners, Jesus Christ died for us. You sent your Son, and that whoever would believe in Jesus is the Son of God, the one who died, was raised, paid the price for our sin, and is indeed now seated at the right hand of the Father. What a magnificent picture of love, of triumph, of impending victory, and of joy of being in the presence of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. So Holy Spirit, as we gather here this morning, we're mindful of the fact that uh, you're the one who, who brings comfort. You help us to recall that this is our Father's world, and we don't want to forget that. He is good. He is our Father. He is our Maker and our Creator. He's the God of heaven and earth. And so as your children here gathered together in this place or as we find ourselves in our homes or in care facilities or in hospital rooms, let it be again that the overwhelming peace of the Lord Jesus Christ would be ours, that we're not forgotten, that he knows the very number of hairs on our head. He knows the uh, thoughts of our hearts the words that we speak, the places that we go. As the psalmist, uh, over the last few weeks, as we've read that, and the psalmist says, that in my, my laying down or in my rising up, Lord, you are there. And so we thank you. And in this time of, of some tumultuousness, in times of, yeah, wondering about debates and words that are chosen and character issues and uh, party platforms, wondering about uh, testing and uh, school and teachers and the extra cleaning that's required, wondering about students and uh, sometimes in class, sometimes doing virtual uh, learning. Lord, it just seems so topsy-turvy. And so we would ask again that you would help us as believers, especially in this age, in this time, to be gracious, to be flexible, to be stalwarts as we stand on Jesus Christ, as we look to be Christ-like, as we look to be Christ to others. In our words, in uh, holding doors open, in, 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 in wearing masks or in, in sending a card, uh, Lord, there are so many ways. Picking up a telephone and asking somebody if we can deliver groceries, whatever it is, Allow us again to be able to use actions and words to declare again that we are believers, that we're in the palm of your hand, and that we want to bring you glory. Lord, together here, we who are gathered in this place, we give you thanks for the Donnas and for the Joys and the Luettas. Uh, we give you thanks for Jaretta's birthday today. Lord, uh, bring healing on her with this sinus infection. Thanks for her birthdays celebrated, and we think of uh, those infamous ones, those big numbered ones, the 80s. Thanks for Dennis Weaker. Thanks, God, again, just for the number of ways that you bless us. We continue to uh, lift up one another with joy. We get to lift one another up, Lord, as we sometimes find ourselves burdened because we care. We want to live into Scripture. Isn't it Galatians 6 that says that uh, uh, each one should carry their own burden, but at the same time, it also says that we should carry one another's burden. It's this working together. It's this being in relationship. It's this partnering together in the gift of life. And Lord, it's been months yeah, January with that first COVID uh, find, uh, March 15th, our service is canceled, and here we are now, the last week of October, on this Reformation Sunday. God, it's been long, but find us faithful. 
And we would ask on this Reformation Sunday that uh, uh, your spirit would blow through this country. That suddenly people would recognize that not only have they been using words that hurt, words that are false, but words that come from hearts, some of it premeditated, some of it because of sin. God, help us to put a hand in front of our mouths. Help us to be godly men and women, boys and girls. Help us to live with integrity, to speak truth, to think before we speak, to do intentional acts of kindness. So, Spirit of the living God, again, we're just reminding you of history. While you did it to the people of Israel over and over again, I think it was it, 2 Chronicles 20 where Jehoshaphat uh, had the whole country pray and fast. Franklin Graham is calling uh, us as a country to pray and fast today. So we do lift up the United States of America. We're mindful, Lord, that in the 1730s, that first great awakening happened. We're mindful, Lord, that in the 1850s, the second great awakening, the Sunday school revival took place. We're grateful, Lord, for that which happened at the turn of the, the 20th century. Then we think of the Jesus movement in the 1960s and 70s and all of the Christian music that has come since then. Lord, we long for... We ask again that your spirit would come, that you would be first in all of our hearts and our thoughts and our minds and in our actions. Thanks again for this local congregation called Chancellor Reformed Church. Thanks for the things that we'd like to do and still hold out to you as you lead and guide. Thank you for studies. Thank you for relationships, for moms to moms, to, to uh, youth groups. And thanks for letting us explore what it would look like to do curbside ministry, uh, food distribution. God, if ever there's a need to be mission-oriented, we're finding that that time is now. People are wondering about Jesus, and yet it seems as if we can't do those things that we've done in the past. And so help us to learn how to do them new. Maybe it's through digital means. Maybe it's through the old-fashioned pick up the phone and just call more and more. Whatever it might be, we grant it to you. We give it to you. And we say, lead us. Lead us in the way everlasting. As Psalm 139 ended, so it is that we end this prayer, giving you thanks again for hearing and for letting us come and to say, Lord, we lay these things at your feet, for you are a loving and good Heavenly Father, and we pray it in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. And amen. Well, folks, here we are in a new series. So we have finally moved through the Psalms, not all 150. We'll do that some other time as we have time together. But um, Again, as I intimated last week, we're starting this series in part because there is stuff happening in our community, stuff that's happening in our denomination, and stuff that's happening, of course, in our country and in our world. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of talk about uh, gender identity and, um, yeah, just... So what we're going to do is we're going to start a series, but we're going to start this series back at the beginning. We've got to start something. So let's just use this silly example, but if God created a wheelbarrow and I were to bring the wheelbarrow up here and none of us knew what it was, we'd obviously want to either ask the maker what it is or what's the purpose for this wheelbarrow, whatever it is. So the inventor of the wheelbarrow would be able to tell us what it is, why it was created, and... Again, if something is invented already, we can't go around and say, oh, that's not a wheelbarrow, that's a transport truck. You can say what it is that you want, but it's a wheelbarrow, right? How do we speak into this stuff as God's people? How do we ourselves make sure that we stand on solid ground? And so as we do this, we recognize that we came off of last week's Sunday. We talked about a spiritual sonogram, right? 
Lord, thank you for making me. I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Before I was even knit together in my mother's womb, you already knew me. You numbered my days. I mean, oh, just wave after wave after wave of the Heavenly Father's love for us, of His knowing us, of this desire for Him to be in intimate relationship with us. Wow. We want to ask a series of questions over the course of our weeks together. What does it mean for mankind, humanity, men and women, male and female, what does it mean to be created by God? What does it mean to be fearfully and wonderfully made? Or here, Psalm 8, two particular verses, right? The psalmist, again, David, as he stands there and he looks at, at this is my father's world. He looks at all the beauty of creation, but he stands outside and he looks up at stars and his moons and he says, when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, when I consider the moon and the stars, which you, God, have set in place. In another psalm, right, what is it, 72 or 73, it says that God knows every star by name. Oh, and then all of a sudden as he looks at all of this glory in this Father's world, he, he suddenly does a little introspection and he goes, who am I that, that you would think of me? Who are human beings, God, that, that they would be cared for? We seem so insignificant. And then the psalmist continues, right? You, God, have made us just a little lower than angels. You've crowned us with glory and honor. You've made us rulers over the works of your hands. You've put everything under our feet. What does that mean? Who am I? Why was I created? Why did God do what he do? Why does he say what he says about us being created just a little lower than angels and to have some kind of authority? As we looked at all of the Psalms and as we look into these next few weeks together, let's make sure we understand that the most important thing about male and female, the most important thing about us is that God created us to be in relationship with him. We're inescapably bound to our Creator. So we can run, we can hide, we can say things that just are not true to try to cover up what it is that God has done, but we're going to keep coming back to the truth, keep coming back to what it is that God has said. So we finished our series in the third longest book, at least according to the number of Hebrew words, and we're going to move now for a few weeks into the second longest book, the book of Genesis. So, as we look at that, I want Chuck Colson. So, Chuck Colson, um, he was in the cabinet along with Richard Nixon, ended up being part of that Watergate uh, issue that shook, of course, America, ended up serving time in prison, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, became a Christian, and uh, as he was released, he has written I don't know how many books. If you want to read one of his, come to my office. I think I have at least eight of his. Um, but uh, Chuck Colson then, as he became a believer, recognized what it was like to be in prison and started this whole organization called Prison Fellowship. And uh, it's an ongoing ministry uh, that I'm just so proud of, and many of you have supported them as well. So here's Chuck Colson speaking about our topic for the day. Hi, I'm Chuck Colson with this week's Two Minute Warning. Let me start by wishing you a very happy, holy, prosperous, fulfilling New Year. The goal of the two-minute warning is simple. Explain and teach how the Christian view of the world is the only worldview that conforms with reality. And for the church, it means that we need to realize that every issue facing the church, the nation, the culture, and the world can only be dealt with by looking through the lens of a Christian worldview. I want to start the new year by looking at the most radical proposition that lies at the heart of the Christian worldview. A proposition so radical, so profound that it literally changed the world. It's simply this. The revealed truth that man is created in the image of God that man bears the imago dei. You see, from this truth stems every freedom, every human right that we enjoy. It's this truth that bestows incomparable dignity on every man, woman, and child at every stage of life. Let me set, tell you a story that illustrates this. I remember in 1973, President Nixon sent me to Moscow to negotiate for the release of Soviet Jews. I spent five days nose to nose with Vasily Kuznetsov, the hardline Soviet negotiator. 
I told him if the Soviets did not loosen their restrictions, Congress wouldn't pass a very important trade treaty, which the Soviets desperately needed. And it was critical because without the treaty, the historic arms limitation agreement that Nixon had achieved would fall through. For five days, he pounded the table. He wouldn't budge. He shouted, you have no right to interfere in our internal affairs. These aren't your internal affairs, I told him. Human rights are not conferred by government. They cannot be denied by government. Human rights are God-given to everyone. We call them inalienable. The last day I recited the opening lines of the Declaration of Independence. Kuznetsov stared at me. Then he rose from the table, slammed down his papers, and announced, Mr. Colson, tell your president we will do our part. That year, 35,000 Jews were released, and grain was shipped. Now, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but I was steeped in American history and political philosophy. I love the words of the Declaration of Independence. All men endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. I joined the Marines to defend those words. I would defend them with my life. But why did Jefferson pen them? Where did they come from? Well, they were a culmination of 2,000 plus years of reflection on the radical truth that man has created in the image of God, endowed with freedom, creativity, and dignity. Of course, that truth was first revealed to the Jews. Look at Genesis 1. But it was the church that proclaimed to the known world the dignity of man. It turned the classical world of Greece and Rome on its head. It freed slaves, elevated women, lifted up the poor, combated abortion and infanticide. It's why Christianity exploded engulfing the ancient world. Folks, here's the point. Every freedom we enjoy, every right we claim, is defensible only because man is created in the image of God. Over the coming year, come to ColsonCenter.org often. Browse, read, learn how the Imago Dei, the image of God, that radical truth that led to human freedom and built the greatest, most advanced and humane civilization of all time. Learn why we must defend the dignity of human life if we wish to remain free and prosper as a nation and a civilization. I'm Chuck Colson. That's this week's Two Minute Warning. So that was from 2012, and obviously he makes the uh, request, you know, come and visit his website, which, by the way, you can do. Uh, I'm saying come to worship uh, over these next weeks as we unfold what it means to be created in the image of God and how that deals with Christian sexual ethics. That's really what, uh, where we're going. So as we look at Scripture, let's pray together, either in your heart or out loud. As the hymn writer penned these words... So they capture our desire this morning, Holy Spirit. Open our eyes that we might see glimpses of truth thou hast for me and for us, this local church. Open our ears that we may hear your voice of truth. Illumine us through God's holy word. For this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. And amen and amen. So let's start with a, with a story. And the story is found in the Gospels in various places. Here's Mark's rendition of it, right? So there are a group of people who are there, and they don't like Jesus. They want to test him. And so they come to him, and they said, Teacher, we know that you are a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Uh, it's not as if you're political or playing games. Jesus, you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. So here's the question we want to ask. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? But Jesus, knowing their hearts, he knew their hypocrisy, and he said, why are you trying to trap me? So he said, bring me a denarii and let me look at it. So they brought him a coin, and he asked them, whose portrait is this? Whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then Jesus said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And those who sought to trip him up were absolutely amazed at his answer. Hmm. Give me a coin, Jesus says. Who's, whose head, whose image is on it? Caesar's. Well, then give that to Caesar. But give to God something. 
I don't have any coins with God on it, do I? D- do you? Ladies, those of you that have those, those, those really small purses, you know, those suitcase things that you have everything in there, can you dig out one of those? Oh, so what was Jesus saying? Yeah, pay taxes, give to Caesar what's Caesar's, but give to God what's God's. Uh, I'll give you permission. Can, can you just kind of look around? Not just to see who's here, but just, can you look around? You're looking at them. Give to God's what is God. Who has God's inscription on them? To whom do people belong? Believer or unbeliever, give to God what is God's. There is no founder of any religion Whoever came up to some other person and gave them that value and said that they were belonging to God. Jesus recognized something in people, even those who were hypocrites, even those who looked to trip him up. We're going to unpack this uh, imago Dei, this, this made in the image of God, and we're going to look and we're going to see over the course of what we would call creation. That's where we're starting today and next week. We're going to talk about the fall. We're going to talk about being restored. That image of God that has been marred is being restored and ultimately will be what we call consummated in all of its fullness and glory as it was in the beginning beginning, so it will be for us. Wow. If we could, I'd have you turn around to somebody and say, hey, you're not a bad coin. You look like you got Jesus' inscription on you. That's it. Whew. So a few weeks ago, maybe a few more than that, uh, for 14 days, this was dormant. Uh, I had cut the whole thing down. So three years ago, Jay and Leon had given that to me to try to get me to understand that Chancellor Reformed Church was like a money tree, that they were very, very rich and that I should come here. No, they gave it to me because they wanted us to feel welcome, and this was a wonderful thing. And I cut it all the way down, and now it's starting to come up again, all kinds of little things. I would hope that in our series, you and I would have this, this, this bursting forth, this coming back to understand what Genesis is about so that we have a foundation on which to stand regarding us being created in the image of God and what that means, especially for Christian sexual ethics. So here's the picture. I love it because Genesis talks about the beginning, about the creation of life and everything else. And I like it also because look at the book. The book is uh, opened on the left-hand side. I like to picture that as somebody who took the picture knew that a Hebrew Bible, of course, is read from the back to the front, and you start reading from the right to the left, and I thought this was just really clever, and I know that you caught it as well. So anyway, there's the picture. This is the word of the Lord, three verses, Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image... In our likeness, interchangeable phrases, in his image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Follow along with me. Look at the pronouns, singulars, and plurals. Interchangeable. Something's going on. So God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the flesh in, or the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's start, shall we? Let's start thinking, if we can. The Bible is pretty clear that God created. So Genesis, in the beginning, that's where the word comes from, right? For the book, in the beginning. So here's God doing this creating. And as it unfolds, we're going to look at the the first chapter, but we just read that God created creatures. 
So in one hand, we need to understand that you and I, as created men and women, boys and girls, male and female, that we are creatures. We don't give birth to ourselves. We don't uh, uh, breathe on our own or have our hearts beat. Somehow something is behind all that. As creatures, we are dependent. We have to understand that principle. But as creatures, we are also persons. So we are a created person. And we're going to unpack what that looks like. People who have the ability to choose, again, within certain confines. We have freedom. We have communication. We can talk about history. We can make goals and have vision and future. We'll unpack all of that next week. But let's start. Genesis chapter 1, and if you have a Bible, I'd just like you to ask to, to open it, and if you have a Bible from home, even better, because you get to do some of the things that I've just done in, in mine. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and then we have the culmination of that creation as he began to do that, our chapter, right? Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. But look with me first here. In the beginning, God created. What kinds of things did he create? As you go through chapter 1 and you find this phrase, then God said or and God said, you'll realize that it's there seven times through the text. All happening before we get to the creation of men and women. And God said, and God said. Well, what's he doing? The whole piece, before we get to mankind, is about creating, in a sense, opposites. Light, darkness, water, land, sun, moon. So there is a separateness. The author of Scripture, here Moses, through the power of the Holy Spirit, is helping us to understand that God is creating, but in a sense, he's creating difference. He's separating things out, right? So over and over, and God said, and God said, then God said, seven times you see that before we get to our text, verse 26. Second observation, for you and for me at least, is every time uh, God creates living things, as in things that breathe, so start with me at verse 21. So God created the sea monsters, every living creature that moves, every winged bird of every kind. And then later on it says, and creeping things and animals of every kind. You just start being blown away. Nowhere in that text, it's silent, and I think it's silent for a good reason. God is just able to create because He can, He does. But there is never any reference to that phrase we just read in Scripture about creating them in His image. Now, I realize that we have some children here, and so I just want to, I don't want to negate God making every winged creature, every sea creature, every crustacean according to its kind. Just let this kind of ooh and ah, ready? Ooh. Wow. Look at the color, God. Oh, from eggs to lily pads to pelicans to... What's that thing in the middle? God, I, how do you come up with this stuff? It's amazing. Ooh. Close ups of insects. Biology, the study of life, the study of understanding what it is that God made from entomology to him, you know. We're just amazed with the number of branches that come off of just from zoology or biology or botany. Plants? Garden stuff? Turnips? Butternut squash? Green beans? Seedlings? 
400 different kinds or shades of, what is it, gray and or green? God, I, I, we're in awe. <laughs> Cacti that are in the desert where there's no water and they still get flowers? How do you do that? <sighs> Whoa. Ornithology. Can't even say it, but I can say bird. Boy, God. Some really cool birds. Hummingbirds at 1,200 beats per second or whatever it is, and cockatoos, color. How do, when a mother leaves to go find a worm, is she going like half a mile, quarter of a mile? How does she get back to the babies? How does she know to help chew the stuff so that the baby gets cereal? It's like us giving pablum to babies instead of steak right at the beginning. Oh, <laughs> birds of a feather stick together, even when it's snowing outside. Oh, my. The majestic swan. Oh, oftentimes with babies on her back. Ichthology. Not ick as an ill bad, but wow, fish. Right? The sign of the Christian. Every time, in, right after Jesus, when there was Roman persecution and you wanted to go to worship and you had to go into the catacombs in Rome at least, they wanted to know if you were a believer or not to let you in and you just kind of made the sign of the fish. Ho oh, ho! And God delights in fish. He's got his eye on you. Oh, so big. He even has a sense of humor. We call this the clownfish. Oh. This is called the square fish. And look, it fits. <sighs> Mr. Garrison, have you ever caught a square fish before? No. <sighs> Salt water, eh? Oh. Kiss a dolphin. No, there's plexiglass in between. Flipper. To the huge whale, a blue whale that has a heart as big as a Volkswagen Beetle. And so the Lord created wind and fish and animals that slither and hop and do everything on land, and He created every one of them according to its kind. Do you ever think God? Why, why did you do that? Why did you make all of these different fish and these varieties and species of birds? And God says, because I can. What kind of a God is this? That he would make freshwater fish and saltwater fish and alligators and crocodiles and Indian elephants and African elephants and big and small and colors galore. Because he can. Because he did. Because he delights in being creative. Wow. I get blown away by these high definition pictures of animals. <sighs> and somehow God wants something that he creates to be able to what? Rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and every living creature that moves on the ground. Who, who could that be? Who? Well, here's part of the sad thing. There are people in the world who recognize that um, whales could be, we can make images of whales. We could take... Uh, people figures, and we could put big things on them or little things or stretch them out. We could put pitchforks in their hands. We could put them half man, half horse. We can, we can create all of this kind of stuff, and we can start praying to these animals that were created by God. And we think, oh, that's all old-fashioned, and that's Baal, and the Ashtoreth, and Moloch, and all of these idols that were spoken of in the Old Testament. But then when we get to the New Testament, we get to this big thing here. Look at all of the idols that we've created. Sports figures, 
entertainment figures, real housewives, stick with the Kardashians. I mean, unbelievable. Thing after thing, right? Power, approval, comfort, stress. God created all of this beauty just to be able to say, I did it, for us to be in awe of it and not to create idols out of them, be it animals, plants, and or spirits. There is no spirit hiding in a tree. We're not animists. But isn't it interesting? In fact, one of the commandments, right? It's number two, isn't it? Uh, Love the Lord your God, but you shall make no graven image of anything that is on the earth, that is under the earth, or that is over the earth. Don't go making idols. Why? God created them for His honor and glory, for His purpose, for our enjoyment, but they're just wood. They're plants. They're, 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 they're things that we think we give power to, but He says don't. Don't go making any graven image. And yet, in a good way, can I say, but God did, didn't he? What did he do? And God created man and woman and made them in his own image. Wow. Huh. Unbelievable, God. So we're not supposed to be idolaters in any stretch of the imagination. We're not going to worship and bow down to Baal or to Buddha or to any of that stuff. We don't bow down to each other, but in each other do we see God's character? Do we see the image of God? Do, it, or do you and I see that we are representatives? God somehow, who created the animals, gives to us then the ability to oversee that. In a sense, we are to be God-like. We're not God. We don't worship each other. But we're representatives of God. There's something in us. And he's happy with it and he blesses it. So, Imago Dei, right? Uh, it kind of sounds, it's kind of a chick thing, isn't it? Uh, uh, Yesterday, our, our grandson was over, and after he had a shower, he wanted to smell like Opa. And so the girls gave him my Drake Noir. It's a, it's a, a French, uh, uh, ooh, monsieur, it smells kind of nice. It's, in a minute, you smell it. Oh, yeah, that's, that's me. That's my stuff. Imago Dei. It's, 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 it's special. It's, it sounds so... You are created in the image of God. So Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, let us create, let us make humanity in our image. And folks, let me tell you, that word us has just thrown people absolutely out of kilter. Here you are, if you're a person from Israel, or from the, the Jew, the tribe of Israel, do you understand that uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 says, Hear, O Israel, for the Lord is God. The Lord our God is one. There's only one. How can this be an us in the text? <laughs> Already there from the very beginning, from the very first chapter, there's this, 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 this peace that goes on. God doesn't have a conversation with the us regarding birds, fish, and everything else, but then suddenly God says, let us make man. Oh, Kathy and I got married in 1979. By 1970, that was August. By September of 1979, my father took me up behind the barn and says, why don't you have any grandkids for me yet? 1980 came along, 1981 came along, 1982 came along, 1983. Uh, Kathy and I, we had conversations, we were both in graduate, uh, or undergraduate and graduate schools, uh, and, and, and we kind of had a little conversation. Hey, honey, do you think maybe, uh, like, do you think maybe we could, you know, have a child? Uh, we have a conversation. C can you see the maker of heaven and earth? with somebody else, 
saying, we're going to make something so unbelievable. Let's have a conversation. And so here is God the Father, God the Son, as it tells us in Colossians chapter 1 or the book of Proverbs, I mean, variety of places, and God the Holy Spirit, Genesis 1-1, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face. Here is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit speaking the Trinity. Again, you go to Matthew's gospel, Jesus is there in the Jordan River. You hear the voice of the Father, you see Jesus in the water, and the Holy Spirit coming like a dove on him. It's the Trinity. And here, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit have a conversation. What do you think? Let's do it. Let's make humanity in our image. Oh, oh. Wow. Again, so much is inferred in the text, but you, you, you've got to catch it with me. He loves the animals, he loves the plants, he loves the creation of the world. Every time he says it's good, we're going to look next week at a time when the Lord, said, or the Lord God said, something's not good. But here you have the Trinity and he speaks. And what is it about the Trinity? Again, when they say, let's make mankind, men and women, in our image, What's that image? We'll unpack it more. But for sure, that image is about communicating. That image is about the three of us choosing together. It's about community. It's about when you think of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit absolutely in step with each other. It's about relationships. And so when the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit end up making mankind humanity, mankind, again, a hard word. Adam is the name of the first man, even the first woman, but Adam also just means man, mankind. So when God creates mankind, humanity, men and women, he does it in his image. Wow. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, this isn't really a big thing, is it? And I go, well, I, I think it is. I think Genesis 1 is a really big thing because if you look in the whole Old Testament, there are only three times that the phrase in his image or in his likeness is used. And there's a bit of a progression on here, so we're going to look at it real quick. The New Testament is full of them. And by the time we get to week three or four, we're going to see something about how God is redeeming us because we are his image. So... We find it in chapter 1. Next time is chapter 5. So he, God, made him, Adam, in his likeness. Male and female, he created them. He, then Adam, the actual person who's married to Eve, became the father of a son, Seth, and it says, and in his own likeness, after his image. Now, we can unpack that one of two ways, at least as far as I can see right now. Either they're trying to tell us that something that is created, when it creates something, it's in their image or in the image of God. Or because chapter 5 and chapter 9, the other place where this phrase is used, happens after Genesis 3, is the author of the book of Genesis through the power of the Holy Spirit telling us that something has happened. And now instead of saying, in God's image, Adam has a son named Seth who is in his image. Is God out of the picture? The next time we see it is right after the flood, right? The story of the flood. Before we get to the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And here you have God saving Noah. And God says, whoever sheds the blood of mankind... The new rules, as the ark opens and as eight of them get out and as the world gets populated again, God says, whoever indeed sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God has God made man. In other words, something has happened. Death is now here, according to Genesis chapter 4, Cain and Abel, and along comes the flood, and as we start something new, we're not supposed to forget that mankind is created in the image of God, male and female are created in God's image, and you can't go around be killing them. You can't be doing abortions, you can't be doing murder, you can't be doing any of that kind of stuff. Why? Because every person 
Every living human being, if you're Australian, if you're Czechoslovakian, if you're white, if you're yellow, if you're black, every human being has been created because they are a person, they have the image of God in them. There should be no racism even as we talk about all of the events that happen around us. Because every one of us should realize that every person, even those that might be challenged, Down syndrome, whatever it might be, created in God's image. So we'll end today. What do I want you to see? I want you to see that this great God, just because He can, He creates. Well, he creates it because he is creative and he's good and he's kind and he separates all this kind of stuff and he makes sun and atmosphere and water and land. But all of that culminates, comes together at the end of chapter 1. And next week as we start to unpack that little piece in Genesis 2, 18 and on, all of a sudden we realize that he created it because he wants to be in relationship. Oh, he loves a beautiful swan. He loves the 400 kinds of mallard duck types or whatever there are. But oh, does he love you and me. (sighs) Team, come on up. Imago Dei, image of God. Let's pray a prayer alongside Scotty Smith. This one is entitled, A Prayer About Not Being Idle About Idols. So let's come with a heart that's that's repentant and that recognizes that God wants to put us on a pedestal, not because we're worthy, but just because he delights in us. He makes us worthy. Pray with me. So, dear Father, we recognize that idolatry is everywhere because there is no such thing as a non-worshipper anywhere in the world. We recognize that the Apostle John wrote, Dear children, keep yourselves from idols. For me to obey John's command to keep myself from idols requires so much more than simply staying away from ancient sites, pagan temples, or man-made idols. Father, I've never been more aware of the invisible pantheon of idols that are constantly angling and clamoring for my heart's worship. How I wish that as soon as you placed me in Christ, my struggle with idolatry would have ceased. But that's simply not the case, or this scripture would be entirely irrelevant. Sometimes the approval or the rejection of people has more sway over my heart than what you think about me. Sometimes my need to be right is more compelling to me than being righteous in Christ. Sometimes my desire to be in control of people and circumstances claims much more of my time and more energy than me seeking your face, savoring your grace, and serving your Son, the only true King. God, these are just a few of the things that bear the marks of idolatry in my heart. So have mercy on me, Father. Free my foolish heart from giving anything or anyone the attention, the allegiance, the affection, and the adoration that you alone deserve. The fact that I'm one of your dear children, I'm forgiven, I'm secure, I'm righteous, and I'm beloved in Jesus Christ. That should be all the motivation I need to keep myself from any form of idolatry. May the gospel of your grace relentlessly expose and dethrone all empty nothings from my heart. Help me again, Lord Jesus, to realize that I've been created by you, that I'm precious to you, and so is the person around me and the ones that I go to school with and the ones that I work with and the ones everywhere in the world. Grant us grace. Give us eyes to see this truth. And help us to live treating others with honor and respect because they're important to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And as we live that way, we get to say in everything, word and in deed, praise God.
Let's stand and sing and close together. sisters, again, recognize what Jesus Christ has done for us. If you have any questions about him, please give me a shout, a jingle, an email, whatever it may be. I want to talk to you about Christ. We'll look more next week at how it is that the Father, Son, and the Spirit, Genesis 2, created us in their image. Go and live in that image now. Be God's people. Stephanie's got coffee and or tea. If you're leaving, make sure that you drive safely, and we'll see you back next week when it's 50 degrees. Blessings.